All right. We're going to start. I want to thank you all for coming. This is uh, the fifth in a series of five presentations on Hubert Harrison, Theodore W. Allen, and the uh, centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. Uh, the first one, we did a, an overview. Then we did two on Harrison. We did one on Allen, and this one will be on Allen. When I say on Allen, primarily on Allen, but Harrison will come in, and a few other topics will come in. Um, we're going to have all five sessions up uh, online, and we're also going to break them into many little short segments, right, on topics like the three crises or this or that, which may be useful, you know, reminders, maybe good to pass around to friends, and we do hope people will share this as we get it all in place. Um, today, I want to open, and I want to um, just be open again, beginning, because we're going to talk about Alan his three main theses in the invention of the white race. And I know you've heard this before, but in light of what is out there, in, what, in, in light of what is out there in, in the U.S. and on the left, I think it's important to be clear on, on what he's saying and actually to be clear on the importance of it. And he says that the white race was invented as a ruling class social control formation. It is ruling class driven. It doesn't just emerge from psychocultural factors or things like this. This is what he's contesting, right? In response to labor solidarity, labor solidarity. This is why the labor question is so crucial to all of this. And as we'll see later, his understanding of the proletarian nature of the European and African Americans who are laboring in that period. These are laborers, right? In the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's Rebellion, 1676 and 1677. And again, there were 10 laboring class and servile revolts in the period leading up to this. The question of how the ruling class was going to maintain social control was at the fore, right? So this is very important. And just to say, well, we're going to bring in people and enslave them, that wasn't going to work. Even though the Royal African Company gets set up in the 1670s, you just keep ruling class just can't say, well, okay, we'll start bringing in black laborers and enslave them because there was turmoil at their door. They burned the capital. They kicked out the governor. They had to devise a means of social control, right? This is the this is this story of the invention of the white race. So what Allen then describes is how a system of racial privileges was deliberately instituted by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie in order to define and establish the white race and establish a system of racial oppression. And racial oppression is different, he argues, than national oppression. And the difference is in how social control is maintained and which is the key group that the ruling class uses to maintain social control. Under racial uh, oppression, the key group is the laboring class, the laboring class of the oppressor group, right? The laboring people of the oppressor group, where a national oppression, a sector of the oppressed group is promoted, you know, to help maintain social control. So, and there's different things that happen with those different systems of control, one of which, and we'll see in a second, that Harrison and all the early Afro-Caribbeans comment on mm -hmm. how vicious the white supremacy is here when they come here compared to what they knew down in the Caribbean, right? The third and crucial point that Allen makes in his work is that the consequence of this system of racial oppression and this invention of the white race was not only ruinous to the interest of African Americans and not simply the enslaved African Americans, but free African Americans who were victimized by this racial oppression, but it was also disastrous for European American workers. It is not in their interest. It wasn't in their interest. And he tries to document this and go through this. And this is qualitatively different than what you will see. And I've mentioned this several times. If you go online and go to Wikipedia and you read about white privilege, and the first statement is all white people benefit from white privilege. Well, we know the ruling class benefits and stuff, but Alan's making a much more profound argument. Or if you go to the white privilege conference where 2,000 people attend each year, 
They hammer, all white people benefit. Allen is saying something very different, and he tries to back it up with historical fact and documentation, which is what makes his analysis all the more forceful and powerful and more appealing, I think. So his argument is that the position vis-a-vis -vis the rich and powerful was not improved, but weakened by the white privilege, white skin privilege system. One of the key points that Allen makes, and this is the one I told the story before, but when I first heard him speak back in 1969 at a precursor to this facility, going way back four generations earlier, uh, called um, Alternate U, he gave a talk and he made these points. And I can't stress how important I think this is for anyone who wants to be a political activist today, who wants to see serious social change. He makes the argument and backs it up that in the three periods of national crisis, the three big periods previously, characterized by general confrontations between capital and urban rural and uh, laboring classes, and the three periods are Civil War Reconstruction, Populism, and the Great Depression, the key to the defeat of the forces of democracy, labor, and socialism was in each case achieved by ruling, a cla ruling class appeals to white supremacism, basically by fostering white skin privileges of laboring class European Americans. I don't think that can be stressed enough. This is the one that I first heard in 69, and it stayed with me, and it haunted me. If this is true, what are we going to do about it, right? Now, what I want to do before we go into an overview, a brief, very brief overview of Harrison and Allen, and then get into certain topics, is I want to offer from an article I did. It stated July 2010, but they put that date on it. It was actually submitted in 2011. An article I did on the general topic we're talking about today, uh, in developing conjunctures, a developing crisis, right? Um, but I opened up very early in the article with some statistics to make to reinforce these points that I'm making, who benefits, the ruling class, everything being shaped in a white supremacist fashion, but working people, laboring people, suffering under this. So just very briefly, and these are about three years old, but basically what I'm going to show you holds. And these, what the statistics I'm going to show you are all in this article. You can go to it. And if it's a certain statistic from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you can go to that web page and get the latest, you know, if you want, if you want to pursue it further. So here we go. Basically, the facts of the developing conjuncture, of what we're confronting now, the gap between rich and poor is extreme and it's widening. Poor and working people are suffering deeply under U.S. capitalism. The ruling class and their media constantly go to tell us, oh, we're doing fine, we got it good, and all this. You know, in my workplace, I did 30 some odd years in the post office. Every day, those foremen would be telling me that. Alan talks about coming up out of the mines and the boss smiling, you know, as they're coming up out of the mines, saying, oh, you got it good today, right? Yeah, we know better. Um, very important, comparisons with other advanced capitalist countries show how poorly U.S. workers. This is where sometimes stepping outside a little, you get a little better perspective, you know, and, and you can challenge these notions of all the uh, illusory benefits of, of this system, right? And the point I stated earlier, and we will see, there is a definite, unequivocal white supremacist shaping to all these conditions. So, in 2010, the Congressional Budget Office reported that the after-tax income gaps between the richest 1% and the middle and poorest fifth had more than tripled in less than 30 years between 1997 and two, uh, 2000, uh, 1999 and 2007. More than tripled. The concentration at the top of the income scale was the greatest at any time since 1928. That's right before the Great Depression. And when you have this gap, this widening gap, what this, what this leads to, people at the bottom can't buy. And this is when you really go into a deep depression. It's, called, it's, it's what Marx would call a crisis of overproduction. It's not that they can't produce. They can produce whatever they want. But people can't buy, right? 17% of the workforce, over 25 million unemployed or underemployed. 17%, that's one in six. Social Security, people, and we, we all probably know people who are doing this, 
can't find jobs, can't make a living, uh, go on social security, anything you can do to try and pay some bills, right? And there's marked increase in social, uh, in applications for social security. Poverty. 40 million Americans, 13 point, were living in poverty. And this is when, I, I, I forgive me for not remembering the exact number, but poverty level was like 13 or $14,000 a year. And look at this staggering number, 40 million, right? Food stamps, 50% of the children, half of every child in this country, half of the children in this country, at one point in their life are gonna be on food stamps. This is the richest country in the world. Just a fraction of what we spend on defense every year could, could address all these issues, right? Healthcare, over 46 million. We know there's been some adjustment in the last two years, but it's still a staggering number as far as I know. It's up over 40 million and um, still being shaked out, right? A little bit shaken out. Compared to workers in other advanced capitalist countries, it's important to see how the U.S. workers are faring. I'll get to that in one second. The foreclosures had hit a record high. Economic security index, 20% of Americans without a financial cushion experienced a 25% or greater loss of household income. <clears throat> health, the World Health Organization reported that the U.S. health system spends a higher proportion of its product on health care than any country in the world. A higher proportion, not only dollars absolute, higher, and ranked 37th, all the rip-offs, everybody ripping off on that, that health industry. Social Security, staggering, this one I find. 50% of wage earners had net compensation less than or equal to $26,261.29. It's $12.63 an hour, if you're working full time. 50% of the workers in this country. Incarceration, as we now know because there's been increased attention, but we have the highest incarceration rate in the, in the uh, world. And this is very important. Of those people who are being incarcerated, 90% are from below the poverty level. That's the direct link between poverty and incarceration. And it's increased 800% in the last 30 years, and there are many people doing important work on this. The international comparisons, crucial, and much more work should be done on this, and we should encourage people to look into this. Compared to 19 other industrialized countries, the Economic Policy Institute does a study itself. We have weaker unions, lower minimum wages, less generous uh, social benefits than the other countries. Not than one or two, than all 19, right? We work more hours than those in other countries. We do so without all the statutorily, the, the, the in-law paid public holidays, and we are alone amongst this group in not receiving statutorily paid vacation time, right, of all these other countries when the comparison. Most significantly, of the two major measures, and this is what the statisticians use, major measures to measure inequality. One is called the Gini coefficient and the other is the ratio of the 90th to the 10th percentile. Both measures, the U.S. showed the greatest inequality, right? greatest inequality. I know I'm preaching a little bit to the choir here, but these are important to know. Because one of the arguments you're going to hear people say, as I said, oh, people benefit from this, right? Let's be clear. People are not benefiting. Not working people are not benefiting. Certainly other people are benefiting. Now, to all of these numbers, they're intensified and magnified by the white supremacist shaping. So if we look at unemployment, and we've been through this black, at the time I wrote, the black unemployment was reported at 15.6, white was at 8.6, but it's been that roughly that two to one ratio, as I explained from 1947 up to the present in some close variant of two to one ratio. Um, poverty levels running almost three to one, right? People below that poverty line. 90%, I showed 50% of children overall in the U.S. are going to be on, 50, on food stamps. 90% of black children in this country will be on food stamps at one point in their life. 
90%, the richest country in the world, equality index. The Urban League each year puts out a study. It usually comes out in January. It's really well worth looking at because they try and quantify a little bit. And however imperfectly it's done, they give you a little glimpse of what's going on. And they, the numbers haven't changed very much in the last few years. When I did it, their overall equality index was 71.1%. But this was a comparison of how black people were faring compa compared to, quote, white people, right? 57% in economics, social justice, health. So we see, again, great inequality, and it's in basically all the areas that they uh, analyze. Incarceration rates. Black females over 3.6 times the rate of white females. Uh, black males more than six times the rate of white males. Again, Michelle Alexander, no other country in the world imprisons so many of its racial and ethnic minorities as the U.S. And there's work, as we know, being done on this. But again, this cannot be emphasized enough because it ties in with so many of the other issues. And she talks about how America has a set of structured arrangements that locks African Americans into a subordinate political, social, and economic position. The director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics, a fellow named Chaikin, found that 30% of black men, ages 20 to 29, were under correctional supervision. And a young black man, age 18, had a 28, more than a one in four chance of spending time in prison during his life, time in prison being defined as one year. Staggering numbers, right? Jobless rate in Milwaukee. When I wrote this, this was when the Occupy thing was, you know, had just happened recently, and there was one group on the left saying, boy, this looks like the revolution, right? Well, not quite. Um, Mark Levine of the University of Wisconsin. Milwaukee is virtually, it's either one or two, the most segregated city in the country, right? Uh, and people have to understand it. And that Scott Walker comes from the Lily White suburb right outside, right? So we have to understand how this affects also national politics. But a staggering 53.3% of Metro Milwaukee's working age African American males were not employed. They were either unemployed or for various reasons not even in the labor force. This is the highest jobless rate among working age black males ever recorded in Milwaukee. Um, and the widest racial disparity in jobless rates among 40 of the nation's largest metropolitan areas and just very briefly, we'll end with this, Milwaukee is not alone. And these are just some of the cities. But the jobless figure for adult black males, Detroit, Michael, that's where you're from, that area, 59.5%. Cleveland, 52.3%. Buffalo, Chicago, Pittsburgh, and so on. All right. More information can be found on the web page. I think people are aware of that. Now, very briefly, we're going to go through, very briefly, a little, keep Harrison and Alan Lott, because I want to just keep hammering how important these people are and point to some things. We know Harrison, brilliant intellectual, radical internationalist, the father of Harlem radicalism, and a key link between the ideological unity, or in the ideological unity of the two great wings of the civil rights black liberation struggle, the labor and socialist type wing and the race nationalist type wing. He's a key link. People should be paying more attention to him. How was it he was able to play that role, right? What, what, what was he bringing? And Theodore W. Allen, um, going back again, Harrison's 1883 and 27, Allen, we're going to talk about 1919 to 2005. Regarding Harrison, born in Virgin Islands, arrives in New York in 1900. This book, I encourage people to get it and read it and share it and try to, one other thing I'd like to encourage, any public library you come in contact with, encourage them to get it so others can read it. That's how we can pass it on. Also, we have videos on them. We'll have these videos up, but Boston, when we spoke at the Roxbury Public Library in Boston, they did a very nice 45-minute video. It can be shared and passed to people free, right? We try and make as much as we can available. This book, again, 116 pages of notes. This is serious scholarship. There's much to be drawn from it, right? You can pursue other avenues and leads. His 700 articles. I mentioned it's also going to be, we try and have a book out probably next year. Uh, Diasporic Africa Press of some more of Harrison's writings from When Africa Wakes. His 700 articles, 
His papers are available at Columbia University, but everybody here can go online, you get the link on my webpage, and you can see the 102-page finding aid, what he, you know, what he wrote about, who he corresponded with, and you can get a real feel. And then you can go to Columbia because the agreement was, that was made was anyone can have access to that. It's not just you got to have you know, uh, scholarly credentials or anything like that. Allen, working class intellectual activist, self-educated, as we've gone through, former coal miner, teacher, postal worker, originates, or pioneer, pioneer, because whenever you say originate, somebody might say, oh, so-and-so said that word someplace before, something like that. He pioneers his white skin privilege analysis, his groundbreaking analysis in 1965. He's really pioneers the invention of the white race analysis in 74, 75. We have the pamphlet there. It's been reprinted. And he's the author of the two volume, The Invention of the White Race, which now is out in the new edition from Verso Books. And I want to mention this to everyone here because you might want to take advantage of it. Verso Books <coughs> now has put online the paperback editions of each volume at a very reduced rate, free shipping, and they bundle the ebook with it, which is nice if you're, if you're into the ebook technology, right? Or you can share, you know, you can share the book, keep the thing. So, all right. So, Allen's The Invention of the White Race. These new volumes have expanded indexes, introductions, and very importantly, the index is greatly expanded, and I've been corresponding with Verso to see if they can get the full index, because you may have heard the story, but I did a, a monster index so people could find anything they want in these volumes. And right before they went to publication, they told me I had to cut by, by one third for volume two, which I, I just couldn't believe. And then when the books come out, you'll see there's 14 blank pages at the end of volume two. So not good planning, right? Um, other published works by Allen, and these are available, for the, I believe, online. You can find links to all of them on my webpage. Very important. This is the stuff in the 1960s that influences the student movement and the new left. Um, white Blind Spot, some articles he writes in the 70s on white supremacy in U.S. history. This is a critical review of Edmund Morgan. He's a major U.S. historian on the colonial period. Allen says many good things about Morgan's work, but on crucial issues, he points out the difference with what he's saying and backs it up. Um, in defense of affirmative action in unemployment policy, this one, race and ethnicity, again, is on the census, the Latino, the Hispanic category, excuse me, and what the political maneuvers behind that by the government. He's hinting at it back then, and this is getting more and more pronounced nowadays, so we have to pay attention to this, and his critical review of David Rodiger's The Wages of Whiteness. Allen also wrote, and Sean, who's in the back, did a wonderful book review of Allen, a 20-page book review, I believe, for the Chicago Teachers Union publication. Is that right? Sub 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 yeah, independent. independent. Okay, um, uh, on Allen's uh, on Allen's invention of the white race, but also Allen himself did a two-part summary, which you know it's quick and easy. You just go right online. It's not a PDF or anything. You go right to it. You can search, and that's available at Cultural Logic. And this pamphlet that is there is also available free on the web page and through Cultural Logic. So again, it's easy to access, to flip to a friend with a link. Now as we go on and we're talking, talking about Harrison and Allen, Allen one, one of the things, things that hits me every day is, is how unfortunate it is that we and people of our generation don't, don't know more about Harrison and Allen. Because I'm convinced, convinced that they're, that they're two, two of the most important thinkers on race and class in the 20th century. And, and I, I think, think if you, you read, read them, you'll, you'll probably come to similar conclusions. conclusions. But to understand that, I think we have to understand what Marx said 170 years ago almost, right? The ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. The class, which is the ruling material force, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. As they, the ruling class, rule as a class, they rule also as thinkers, as producers of ideas, and regulate the production and distribution of the ideas of their age. Thus, thus, their ideas are the ruling ideas of the epoch. And I think we see this, and for those of us who follow issues, you know, even domestic, international issues, the ruling class, they control the media, they control what we get fed, what we get fed every day, 
They shape and influence where the money goes to the universities, where the grants goes. There's a, it, yes? Sorry, and I was, while I was listening to you speak, I was thinking of uh, Bill Gates. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Yes. Yeah. Or, or Henry Louis or Bill? Bill. Bill, okay, excuse me. And uh, how Bill Gates is using his vast resources to dictate um, public education right. um, from the standard, standard standardization of curriculum, uh, questioning uh, teachers' unions, uh, just just a, a number of things, and and you know from his ivory tower, from his lofty ideas right. with his money, he has a tremendous amount of influence. Exactly, and I I think that's exactly the point yeah. being made here. And just to add, I, I don't think he's ever taught a day in his life, right? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think so, but no, I, but he's got a lot of views on education. <laughs> but I, I think you, you make the point very, very well, and thank you. Um, given that context, I want to emphasize that both Harrison and Allen are autodidacts. And again, we see this in Malcolm, and this is to encourage this in us, right? You know, to read constantly, think constantly. We don't have to be in these institutions, you know, to get clarity and vision and to help move things forward. And in their case, I believe what George W. Stocking Jr., and it was asked previously, this is from his book, on, it's called Victorian Anthropology, he writes about the history of anthropology. First session a woman asked, uh, where was it from? And um, he writes that standing outside the normal process by which intellectual traditions are transmitted the autodidact may embody the spirit of his age in an unusually direct way. And both Harrison and Allen lived in periods of change. World War I era for Harrison, right? Black migration, people coming to New York. Allen is the Vietnam War, and the, the, the student movement, the women, you know, all these things. But, but most importantly, the civil rights, black liberation movement, right? And that's what he, he calls attention to. So they're in these, in these periods, they're looking, they're, uh, what they are, their previous assumptions, um, they've already, for the most part, Harrison and Allen challenged previous assumptions, but they're really able to pursue in new directions as autodidacts in these periods. And both of them, and perhaps we can talk about this later, uh, run into certain problems as autodidacts, right? You know, it's people outside the established things. And Harrison writes, and in the reader, you'll find some interesting things where Harrison talks about the difficulties he has, you know, in terms of shaking people up a little, waking them, you know, calling attention to this. And Alan, of course, is far outside the academy. And um, mostly they both focused on their work and to make it as good as it can be, to say what they needed to say as accurately as they could. Um, and I just think it's important to understand uh, that as autodidacts, uh, it may have been in certain definite ways a, a benefit for them, you know, or to, to allow them. And of course, they both tried to maintain contacts with other, you know, with, with our broad ranges of people, but uh, I, I think it's important. Here's Rogers, as we've said, calls Harrison the foremost Afro-American intellect of his time. We've gone through 700 pieces online. His two <coughs> books, if we haven't emphasized this enough, The Negro and the Nation in 1917. 1920, I'm sorry I didn't put the year there, When Africa Wakes, notice the subtitle, The Inside Story of the Stirrings and Strivings of the, excuse me, New Negro in the Western World. I call your attention to that because there's, um, one edition of it that's out online now, Black Classic Press, <coughs> a nice edition in 1996, I think. But when they did it, two things. They excluded his original introduction. Rogers. Uh, no, Harrison's. These are Harrison's books. And they didn't print the subtitle. So now when things get written on the New Negro movement, it's easier for those to exclude Harrison's central role in that, right? Because they don't realize, you know, they'll talk, people will talk about Alain Locke in 1925, but they don't realize that Harrison in 1917 and 1919 writes the first paper of the militant New Negro movement. In 1919, he edits the New Negro, an organ of the international consciousness, and in 1920, he writes, when Africa wakes, the inside story of the stirrings and strivings of the new Negro in the Western world. He's central to this new Negro movement, yet for the most part, he's been omitted. 
from the historiography on that. Because real good is um, reading it now. Yeah, it's contemporary. You can look around and see examples of what he's talking about. Yeah, right. And even when he's talking about the leaders and the leaders of thought, yes, I, I encourage people to read that if you can when Africa wakes and when we get the new edition you might really like that one because there'll be some you know more background to a lot of the articles they're going to give a lot of leeway to you know really fill in some uh, empty spaces you know in terms of what's there so and then as a journalist and editor so significant in all these areas as a critic as I've mentioned to people uh, praised you know currently by uh, some leading uh, book critics Eugene O'Neill and Harrison from 1907 to uh, front page pieces, Saturday Review of Books, which is the New York Times. And uh, so we, you know, we have Harrison in all these areas as an intellectual, pioneer black activist, socialist, free thought, birth control, new Negro movement, promoter and aid to writers and artists, lecturer for the New York City Board of Education, bibliophile and library popularizer. He is one of the founders with Schomburg of, that sh of the Schomburg Center. He gave books. He and Schomburg gave books. I mean, they built this. He's always trying to pass it on. And he would speak regularly at the uh, library and bring people there. Here's A. Philip Randolph. He and others refer to Harrison as the father of Harlem radicalism. Mm -hmm. I was just speaking two days, uh, several times this week with Joyce Moore Turner, who's an excellent historian, daughter of Richard B. Moore. She has written two wonderful books, Richard B. Moore, Caribbean Militant in Harlem, and um, uh, Caribbean Crusaders and the Harlem Renaissance. Excellent books, she's writing still at 92. And she talks about how her father also, and this is at the eulogy, we were talking about it at the, uh, when Harrison dies in 1927. Schomburg delivers one of the eulogies, Richard B. Moore another, and he, calls, he refers to Harrison as the um, black Socrates. I mean, in, in the sense of his you know, knowledge and bringing it to the people and being in the streets and a great radical internationalist, always emphasizing that. Um, Harrison, another reason why Harrison should be emphasized and should be incorporated in our history is he played, and I believe he is the only person, if anyone shows me someone else, we'll put it, that person alongside Harrison, the only play, person to play unique signal roles in the largest class radical and largest race radical movements of his day. Foremost black organizer, agitator, and theoretician in the Socialist Party, founder of the first organization, newspaper, the Liberty League, and editor of the Negro World and principal radical influence on the Garvey movement. This is the flyer from the founding meeting of the Liberty League in 1917. Woodrow Wilson has led the U.S. into war to make the world safe for democracy. And Harrison's response is, let's make the South safe for democracy. Profound. Stand it on its head. Bring it back to where it should be, right? And again, this is where he invites Garvey up to speak, but he spe Harrison's the featured speaker. Chandler Owen, Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. Here's the new Negro. I've shown you this. A publication he edits, The Women of Our Race, Education in West Africa, Two Negro Radicalisms. This is the points I just made earlier about Harrison and the New Negro Movement. He profoundly influenced a generation. Amongst his generation, he is arguably the most class conscious of the race radicals, the most race conscious of the class radicals. The major radical influence on Randolph, the ra major radical influence on Garvey. Bring it up to date, it's Martin and Malcolm, the lines of dissent we can point to. Harrison Key Link in the two wings of the civil rights black liberation struggle. Rad radical internationalist, extremely knowledgeable. And in volume two of the biography, which is what I really want to get working on now after this session today, we're back to, I got 1,300 pages. And volume two is going to be, a, I think, a mind opener, particularly his writings on Africa and his work, his involvement with Garvey and the communists and the socialists and the Harlem Renaissance. It's, it's going to open new chapters, I think, for many people who really want to research this stuff. Because Harrison, I mean, it's not so much what I'm writing, it's what Harrison did, right? I mean, he's that important. Radical internationalist, and this is Harrison himself, but again, Joyce Moore Turner emphasized that Richard B. Moore, the internationalism of Harrison. And when Harrison talks about the new Negro movement, he emphasizes how it was a break from the, what he called the old Negro leadership, and one of the key areas was the internationalism, right? 
And another was the war, when he breaks from, you know, du, du Bois's leadership on that, right? So Harrison's approach, uh, and by the war, I mean Du Bois's uh, and the NAACP's position, they, they not wanting to push the, uh, openly the federal anti-lynching legislation and uh, the closed ranks editorial, and Harrison was taking a very different position. Harrison's approach, race conscious, class conscious, scientific, internationalist, emphasizes the common people, master of the mass approach in his day, soapbox oratory in newspapers, direct action. Again, the direct action links, he's out there. I was just last week at a Labor Day parade in New Jersey at the Botto House. It's the American Labor Museum. That's where Harrison spoke in 1913 with Curly Flynn and Big Bill Haywood. They were wobblies. They believed in direct action. But Harrison gets that from his crucian roots, too. And it's very important to understand that. And uh, I try to call attention to that. And hopefully, people can build off that because it applies to so many others in so many ways. Literature and the arts, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist. He always challenged white supremacy. Schomburg delivers the eulogy at Harrison's funeral, the main eulogy. He was ahead of his time, he says. He knew how popular Harrison was. And uh, John Henry Clark echoes that uh, 50, uh, 70 years later. There's Harrison's unmarked shared grave. Since we met last time, I believe, I've been in touch with Harrison's granddaughter. And the payment has been made. And uh, I presumably work is now underway to put a grave marker on his site. She said she was led to believe within two months they would have it up. Uh, we've got the emails of everyone. Some of you I'm in touch with on Facebook. But if I'm not in touch with you, please you know, be on Facebook because I'll post. And hopefully, maybe in the fall, we'll be able to go commemorate in some way those who are interested in going up there and commemorating. Because we have this old Hubert Harrison, Theodore W. Allen Society. Maybe we get Fred to video. <laughs> um, Harrison's unremembrance, he's poor, he's working class, black, foreign born, Caribbean. Key reasons Harrison's not better known, key reasons Allen's not better known are because they are radicals. They really are radicals, particularly on race and class issues, and they pose such a threat. In Harrison's case, also very radical on religion. Forthright critic, no long lasting organizational ties. Age, he dies young, he's not martyred like Martin and Malcolm and how history gets written in the U.S., in many places, but in the U.S., this most powerful country, going back to that first, or, or that early slide, about the dominant ideas. This is very important. Much more can and should be done on this, because it, I, it just hurts me to see how Harrison is ignored, how Allen's work is ignored. It, it, so, Again, important points which are going to have bearing on Alan's work too. And again, in the conversation with Joyce Moore Turner, she just reinforced. She goes, Moore was just like this. He goes, and all those early Afro-Caribbean activists were the same. They all commented on the difference between the U.S. and their homeland, the vicious white supremacy they encountered here. And the reason, as we'll see in Allen, what Allen argues very effecti effectively, is how social control was maintained in different ways. Racial oppression here in the US, national oppression down in the Anglo-Caribbean. Claude McKay explained, first time I'd ever come face to face with such manifest, implacable hatred of my race. I had heard of prejudice in America, but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter. This is what Harrison encounters, the lynchings. The difference rooted in, in, in social control, some of the manifestations, lynch terror, formal segregation, class promotion. Harrison, moving quickly now through Harrison, because we'll get to Allen, and then I want to get into some new points today. As a socialist theoretician, he makes major innovations. He's the first, re first black activist in the Socialist Party to write series on the so-called Negro question. Major stuff should be, in any study of the left, this stuff should be examined, you know, and we should be learning from this. And he's arguing racial oppression is socio-historic, not biological. This should be the new litmus test for the socialist, the duty to champion the cause of the Negro. Saying this in 1911 and 1912, too bad we, we, we didn't have access, more access to this emphasizing the duty of all to oppose race prejudice. And he initiated a social, uh, uh, colored socialist club in 1911. His important points, which I know you've heard before, but the touchstone 
and a revolution startling to even think of. Politically, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. Cannot be emphasized enough. It's a guide. Every area of work, let's put it to the test. How are black people fair and what are we going to do about it? And true democracy and equality in this country implies a revolution startling to even think of. How, and we see in the 1960s how that's a catalyst for virtually every other movement for social change. Let, learn those lessons. Learn the lessons of the three crises. So we have to try and build, and this is what Harrison works at continually. He understands the twofold character of democracy in America. If it's a lily white democracy, it's a retardant to social progress. If it's a thoroughgoing democracy, it's a catalyst for social change. This could also be applied to other areas of the world today where we hear about democracies, right? Um, enslaved black laborers as proletarians, this is crucial. And we see it in Harrison in 1912. We see it in Du Bois in Black Reconstruction in 1935, and we see it in Allen, right? And when we understand black labor as proletarians, we learn some of the true valiant struggles in labor history, the, the cover is torn off betrayals by white labor, and we can then more clearly understand the invention of the white race, why it was invented, for what purpose, whose in aims it, it serves, right? <laughs> Harrison concludes when he leaves the Socialist Party that the Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on the white race first and class after. It put the white race first before class. When Harrison break, breaks out to start building his own movement, do concentrated work in the black community, it's a conscious decision to break from the old leadership of Booker T. Washington's political machine and W.E.B. Du Bois and the Talented Tenth. He goes, no, we're going to start at the bottom. That's where you've got to light the fire. Fought with previous efforts, we had generally gone at the problem from the wrong end. They began at the top when they should have begun at the bottom. To attempt to unite and unite the intellectuals was not the same thing as uniting the Negro masses, the key to racial solidarity. And again, as I point out, Du Bois comes to a somewhat similar conclusion many years later. Um, in, in, the, uh, in his writing after, when he's writing for the Negro world, and this is a lot of the stuff that's going to come out in volume two, but Harrison pays particular attention to how capitalism leads to war, how the exploitation of white men in Europe becomes the reason for the exploitation of black and brown and yellow men in Africa and Asia, how the darker races suffer most, but very importantly, how it is the duty of, quote, white revolutionists to show their sincerity by first breaking down the exclusion walls of white. When he breaks and starts doing concentrated work in the, in, uh, in the black community, he, it's not that he's not willing to work with people, you know, European Americans, but he goes, you, you got to take the lead in this fight. You've got you to gotta wage these struggles. You've got to show that this is for real because we can't waste time otherwise. We'll, we'll just go ahead. Yes. pointed out many of the same points in his speech uh, against Vietnam. He spoke about capitalism. He spoke about how exploitation was leading to war. He predicted that America would find itself on a path that it just can't get off of. I mean, most, most of those ideas, many of those <laughs> ideas, in 19, April 3rd, yeah, 1967, yeah. Dr. King pointed out. Well, excellent. We'll bring Harrison into the picture more and more. When this second volume comes and we get all of Harrison's writings out there, um, we'll have a lot more ammunition in this. Um, and he argues again, you know, and I emphasize this, uh, he, he's arguing to the white left, if you will, break down those exclusion walls of white working men before they ask us to demolish our own self-defensive structures of racial, when he's doing race conscious work, you know, in the black community, he says, you know, we, this is what we've got to do, we can't wait around, he's not going to wait around. This is Harrison teaching his course on world problems of race. He taught it at two places, at the Communist Party, it, it was called the Worker School, and for a group called the Institute for Social Study, which uh, met in the uh, Urban League building. And I think this is the group, and I mentioned Richard B. Moore, outstanding orator, Hermie Wieswood, W.A. Domingo, first editor of Garvey's Negro World. Uh, Hermie Wieswood in the back, that's Juliana Jones Burroughs, and there's Harrison. Um, and again, I, as I've mentioned, these are working people, right? Um, in that course, in that course on world problems of race, Harrison writes, or spoke, this is from his notes, 
The King James Version of the Bible does not contain the word race in our modern sense. As late as 1611, our modern idea of race had not yet risen. That's kind of laying the basis for what Alan's going to do later, right? And uh, I, I, I was up in Boston area, and there was one of these guys who had a concordance, you know, had the Bible out in front and stuff, was going to answer any question. I don't know if you've ever seen these people on the street, right? So I came up and I, I said, can you show me something on race? <laughs> and he, he couldn't find anything, you know? So I think Harrison might have been on to something on that. So here we go, Theodore W. Allen. This is what Allen writes. Keyed by what, uh, well, he didn't know about Harrison writing it, but very similar when the first, excuse me, when the first Africans arrive in Virginia, there were no white people there, nor according to the colonial records would there be for another 60 years. It's not in a Virginia record that Allen finds or anyone else until 1691. Winthrop Jordan, a historian who claims to write on all this, says around 1680, but cites no source. So that's why Allen says 60 years. If you do the math, you wonder why he says 60 years. He's allow e even allowing for that, although there's no you know, verifiable proof, if you will. There were no white people there in 1619. White identity had to be carefully taught, and it would be another 60 years before the word would appear as a synonym. Bacon's Rebellion, the key event. We have the account of Bacon's Rebellion. We know they're still not white. They're English and Negroes. They're fighting side by side. They're demanding jointly their freedom from slavery. They wanted to cut them up and chop them to pieces. And Allen argues this is supreme proof that the white race did not exist. That's uh, Thomas Grantham's account that we were reading from or looking at. And uh, crucial that in Virginia in 1676 and 1677, Laboring class African Americans and European Americans had fought side by, by side for the abolition of slavery. There's the three main theses again. Now what Allen is arguing, and I want to emphasize some of this stuff, the white race is a ruling class social control formation. It is not simply a social construct. And again, if you say it's simply a social construct, you leave the back door open for all kinds of ultimately very white supremacist explanations for why things are the way they are now. Mm -hmm. You have to understand and emphasize, this is what he's arguing, that it is a ruling class social control formation. It was invented and maintained, and it is maintained by the ruling class because it serves their needs. That's whose interest it serves, right? And that's what Allen is arguing. It is no part of genetic evolution, it's political. It has served, he argues, the white race has served as the principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination of national life in the United States. Ultimately, this is what they've relied on to help maintain social control. And the question of social control, let, let me just mention on this social control, a ruling elite, you know, there's various ways a ruling elite might maintain control. They might do it just by straight armed force. But if you have to bring an army in or something, that's pretty costly, right? And stuff like that. It's better if you can find domestic things, where, and best if you can get working people to enforce the social control for you. I mean, you can both, you know, make profits off their labor and, um, and ease your burden of social control. And so... Um, this white race has played, Allen's arguing, has played that central role in the history of this country. He argues that white supremacism has been the Achilles heel of the labor, democratic, and socialist movements. And we see Harrison commenting on this, and so many, particularly black leaders, have commented various ways and various times on this. White race and class collaboration. Uh, this is, I think, very important because... Um, we have to understand this white race thing is an all-class association. And it works to serve the interest of the ruling class. Now, when I'm working in the post office, when I'm working 33 years in the labor movement, we call workers, fellow workers who are siding with the boss, and we call them class collaborators. That's what they are. Allen says that the white race is the most basic, prevalent, and historic form of class collaboration in this country of collaborating with the bosses against your fellow workers. What he's trying to argue, this concept of the white worker, he's trying to break that white thing off and emphasize the worker, right? He's trying to challenge and go after that white and appeal to the worker, right? Because the boss is appealing to the white. 
So white identity has been the main barrier to class consciousness in the U.S. It is the incubus. Incubus is kind of a devil, the devil of white identity, right? Three crises, we've been through that. The Great Depression in particular is a prime example, which we've been through how the most recent one, how the turn to white supremacy and reinforcement of white skin privileges. The crucial one, I mean, there's so many aspects of it, but the GI Bill, which is here again, this is how they build these white suburbs, how they, you know, people are separated, grow up in separate environments and stuff. 67,000 GI loans in New York, New Jersey area. Less than 100 go to people of color. That's how you get the ring of white suburbs, New York and every city in the country. And this is a crucial one. Where did that statistic come from? Um, that's in Ira Katz Nelson, When Affirmative Action Was White. But if you go to my article, Developing Conjuncture, you'll see the exact citation for all this stuff, okay? So you'll find it. And I this is great. I, I encourage people, just don't take you know, what I'm saying, but that's why in my works, in the biographies, in the reader, in the conjuncture, they're heavily footnoted because I want to encourage people to go look and take it further. You know? Now, and this one, I cannot emphasize this enough, and I hope everyone hears this. 1929 black to white unemployment ratio was one to one. It's two to one by 1947, and that's all anyone in this room has ever known. Two to one or some variant. It doesn't have to be that way, right? Steps could be taken to eradicate this. I was talking with Sean as we drove here today. You know, you have these groups, left groups, anti-white privilege groups. You know, they meet by the thousands in their conventions. I would love, I would encourage such groups to wage an all-out campaign to address this two-to-one black-to-white unemployment ratio because jobs are so central to so much else that goes on, right? This can and should be addressed, right? So, going on. Allen's history of the five stages of the class struggle. In the U.S., he tries to give a little schematic to it. What's crucial, he argues, is that when the, when the conditions get very bad, they start being overtures of let's get together and fight and struggle on class basis. What has historically happened is the ruling class has turned to reinforce the white race privileges. And unfortunately, uh, what has happened in the past is that the white workers have taken what Allen refers to as the poison bait. And they've repudiated solidarity with, the black, with black labor. Now again, there's that position out there that all whites benefit from white privileges. And what Allen is saying is for the working people, it's a poison bait. It's like a shot of heroin. It looks good, but it's not in your interest. And as, again, as somebody who's worked, or as for people here in this room, if people who might have been in the front lines in the civil rights struggle or anything like this, we know that if we're going to struggle for better, there's going to be some risk involved. You know, there's going to be some risk involved. But that, because of that, we don't not do it. You know, we've got to come together and we've got to understand what we're struggling for and fight the good fight, if you will. Allen, throughout his work, challenges what he thinks are the two main ideological props of white supremacy amongst European American workers. The idea that racism is innate. Again, if it's innate, why fight it? Can't change it. And the idea that white workers benefit. Because if they benefit, why should they fight it? That's the basic question that he keeps raising. But we're going to get into it because there are some rationales that come out, and he addresses them also. The first one, that it's innate, comes from Winthrop Jordan, who refers to racism as an unthinking decision. Mm -hmm. That they benefit, it comes from Edmund Morgan, uh, Emeritus from Yale. And Morgan writes that there were too few free, poor European Americans on hand to matter. Again, this is the case in the Anglo-Caribbean, Jamaica, Barbados, in Harrison, St. Croix, but it is not the case in Virginia and Maryland Plantation. And that's, that's why you get this vicious racial. There are so many laboring class Europeans that the ruling class doesn't want to promote them all to the middle class. So it sells them this white race thing and keeps them as laborers, right? Um, so here's Alan, here's invention of the white race, volume one. Now, I'll, here we're going to just get into a little new territory, and then we're going to get into more in a little bit. If you read Alan's invention of the white race, in his acknowledgments, he writes the following. First, I acknowledge my obligation to two fellow proletarian intellectuals, 
Charles Johnson and William Carlotti, two people I know. These are Lower East Side activists, Charles Johnson, Afro-American, William Carlotti, Italian-American, who cleared away ideological barnacles left from my previous moorings and taught me to say, as Carlotti did, I am not white. Pretty profound. I mean, it's a lot of thinking. <laughs> What's the Johnson and William Carlotti? They're workers. They're workers. Charles Johnson, African American, was a construction worker, still alive. You know, uh, lives down the Lower East Side. William Carlotti, uh, Italian American worker, um, and they both um, were very, very active, as I recall. Uh, yes, go ahead, Sean. Charles Johnson's retired teacher. Oh, oh, excuse me, retired, retired teacher. teacher. All right, excuse me. Well, he, but he did, did he do the job? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll stand corrected by the teacher. <laughs> and um, they, uh, I think they were both very involved. Uh, one of the big, huh? Carlotti was, okay. Um, in the 60s, in the late 60s in New York, there was a big struggle over public education and Shanker and the, you know, the teachers union it set us back quite a ways, right? But shortly thereafter, that's around 68, I think 67, 66, that period, you know, with Shanker and, and 68, thank you. Seven, around 70, 71 on the Lower East Side, there's another big struggle around these issues and a campaign of, I think it was, Sean lives down there, but it, Luis Fuentes, was it? You know, it was headed a slate. Yeah. And I think they were involved in this. And, um, but, so Alan says that. Now, Alan also says in his acknowledgments, if I remember correctly, I don't have it right in front of me, but he talks about, he's talking about the basic he goes, I, I start from some basic premises, and one is no person wants to be enslaved, right? You know, and things like, I mean, he's, he's got this just understanding, you know, this <coughs> basic humanity, and let, let's start, let's, you know, tear all this shit off and let's get right, you know, to it. So that's what he says, and uh, I, I, we can talk more about that later, but in the face of such absurdity, so in volume one, he goes through, and we're doing quick here, he goes through some of the various, what he calls the howling absurdities of how race is defined in various places. We've mentioned some of these. So he decides to look at racial oppression as a social rather than a skin-based phenomenon. And his focus is primarily not on why the bourgeoisie had recourse to slavery. He's very clear. They would impose slavery wherever they can get away with it if they can make money doing it, right? right. And He'll use examples we're most familiar with the enslavement of African peoples, but he'll, use, he'll also point to the examples of the enslavement of the Scotch in Scotland, 16, 1700s, of the English vagabonds in the 1500s, etc. right? Um, so his focus is prim primarily not on why the bourgeoisie would, re re would turn to slavery, but rather on how they can establish that degree of social control necessary to maintain such a system. In Virginia, there was not the turn to racial slavery. And Alan makes a distinction, just if you're reading him, this may be helpful for you, between slavery and racial slavery, right? Racial slavery is a particular form in which the key is the racial nature of the oppression, the racial oppression and he, he, he makes that distinction. And um, so in Virginia, as I mentioned and as I alluded to earlier, after Bacon's rebellion, um, the ruling elite had to, uh, had to find a mean to maintain social control before they could turn to lifetime hereditary bond servitude. He uses the example, he says, when, when they, in, after 1676, if they tried to bring in lots more chattel bond servants, short term, long term, whatever, without devising a mean of so, means of social control, it would have been like adding kerosene to the Jamestown fire. You, you, you think people just willingly go to accept this? No, they're not. There's got to be a system of social control. All right. In volume one, Alan makes some core arguments, very interesting, very important. But he compares Anglo-Norman rule thir roughly around 1300 and Protestant ascendancy later, late 1690s into the 1700s in Ireland, and white supremacy in continental Anglo-America to demonstrate that racial oppression is not dependent on differences of phenotype. If you get to read the book, he gives very many examples. I think you'll find it very interesting, uh, very eye-opening. Um, differences between racial oppression and national oppression, some of the ones that Alan emphasizes, is the intermediate buffer social control stratum 
and social distinctions within the oppressed group, right? By the intermediate buffer social control stratum, who is the group that the ruling class relies on? But how do they treat uh, the oppressed group? And in national oppression, there's promotion of a sector of the oppressed group. In racial oppression, particularly as it gets established, there is no such class division encouraged, no promotion. That's the Dred Scott decision. Uh, so again, he contrasts the Caribbean, where mulattoes were included in the social control group and were promoted into middle class status. And he emphasized that one of the key reasons for the difference is that it is the objective fact that in the West Indies, in Jamaica, in Barbados, there were too few laboring class. After a point in time, there were few, right? And for the ruling elite, rather than just keep a regiment there all the time, you know, a military regiment or something like that, they tried to find domestic means of maintaining social control. And it's over a period of time, and he discusses this. And people will find this, I think, of great interest when he talks about the Anglo-Caribbean, because he brings in some very important historical facts. While in the continental colonies in Virginia and Maryland, there were too many. And this can't be, this is, again, the, the ruling class is determined to make, you know, profit. And so they'll use whatever means they can. He talks about the Irish sea change, how the Irish opponents of racial oppression in Ireland, the victims, the Irish Catholic victims, were recruited into the white race in the U.S., became opponents of abolition. Um, and Allen emphasizes, as opposed to other people who write on this topic, the role of the ruling elite the plantation elite and related financial interests. Fernando Wood, the mayor of New York, is tied in with the Southern Slaveocracy, all these financial interests in New York, the Catholic Church hierarchy, the Irish American establishment in Tammany Hall. These were the ones educated. You got these people coming in, right? And they, this is what they're getting fed and they're getting taught this white stuff, right? It's not like it just rises up. And as one historian right, tries to talk, well, it was, you know, they turn to the white race because of the competition with black labor. You might have heard that argument before. But Allen points out, in this period, the 1840s and 50s, there was three, four, five times more competition with other European immigrants than with black laborers. It's only because this other stuff is being driven and encouraged you know, by these forces, right? Uh, so again, it's very important to look because what Allen does, as I've mentioned previously, he knows what some of the arguments are that are going to come up. And if not right in the text, in the footnotes, or in the appendices, he will bring them up, and he will try and address them, right? Yes? You mentioned on that slide, plantation elite and related financial in interests. So we're talking 1848, is it real, or is it the industrialists? What are the main talk? So well, the financial interest in New York related to the slave trade, in so-called international slave trade and the products, you know, the, the, uh, the three-way trade, right? You know, they're sending products, they're bringing people in, things like this. Fi New York financial interests were very much supportive of, of, of the slaveocracy, right? Okay. Northern bourgeoisie. Alan closes volume one, talks about how the northern bourgeoisie abandoned reconstruction. They used terror. And they decided to reestablish social, this is after the Civil War, after Reconstruction. Now, again, in Reconstruction, you got armies involved and stuff like that. That's pretty costly. They're 1870s, they're looking for a more cost-efficient way of maintaining social control. Well, they had it pretty good down south. You know, I mean, this is the thinking of the elite, right? You know, we'll, let's just use that system, you know? And they really do. And they reestablish social control based on racial oppression and racial privileges for laboring class whites. Some of the main ways they do that is in their uh, free land, you know, and homesteading, immigration, and industrial employment. One of the key in industries down south is the cotton mills. And uh, the cotton mills were lily white, right? The Negro exodus to go to those, some, access some of those lands is turned back by guns, right, in 1879. So he goes in and, and discusses some of this stuff. He ends volume one, and just in sum, and again, I think this is really worth looking at. And let me point out, in each volume, I mentioned this, but there's a 25-page internal study guide which tries to go with the, the flow, the page flow of each uh, volume and describe what he's doing. And I think that can be helpful as you read it because particularly volume one is difficult, right? 
But um, in, in, at the end of volume one, as we sum up, we see that Allen has argued that there was religio racial oppression against Irish Catholics in Ireland. National oppression in the Anglo Caribbean. Now, the ruling elite, it's still this Anglo ruling elite that's doing this, right? But they're they doing racial oppression there in Ireland, national oppression, in Can racial oppression in the Anglo American plantation colonies. And he even makes the argument to show that this is not for all times and permanent, but it's a function of the class struggle. In Ireland, when a struggle heats up with the na Irish national bourgeoisie, the ruling elite is willing to say, okay, you can have national oppression there, you know, in, in Greater Ireland, but we're keeping our bedrock right here. We're keeping this racial oppression in Ulster. That's going to be our base, you know, in case you get too unruly, you know. That's what we, so it's very clear. That you, this is, it's a very good, profound analysis, right? And the same people who were victims of racial oppression in Ireland became defenders of racial oppression in America. So it's to, to show that this is not permanent, you know, it's a function of class struggle, social control needs, issues like that. In volume two, he considers this his major work. Um, and he focuses in volume two on Virginia, particularly from 1607 to 1750. Key dates, again, we're going over this, but I hope you all, you know, this sinks in and uh, you're able to build off it, right? 1622, reduction to chattel labor status. This is a qualitative break from English labor law, a qualitative break from what was going on in Virginia, utterly significant. Bacon's Rebellion, 1676 and 1705, when they begin codifying all these laws, right? All right, he reviews the transition to capitalist agriculture. This is very good. Allen's background is political economy. That's what he taught at the Jefferson School, that's the Communist Party School when he was in the Communist Party, right? And he was, he was good, he, he coordinated major conferences on this stuff from, he, he knows the political economy. And you'll see he makes some fascinating political economic arguments, particularly in appendices. You know, labor cost ratios, things like that. Um, so he goes through the transition to capitalism in England. So this is not feudalism, you know, there's all these rationales for what gets developed later. It's a feudal carryover, you know, all, uh, it's capitalism, right? And he talks about the attempt to enslave um, the vagabonds in uh, England, right? And class struggle in England. Um, he points out, and I'm going to get to this in some of the slides I want to show in a little bit, of all the European powers the key difference from England, with England from France, from the Netherlands, from Spain, from Portugal, was of all the European colonizing powers, only England used European workers as basic plantation workers. They're sending all these plantation workers to Virginia. That's why there's so many. That's why they're not going to develop what yeah, the social control is in the Caribbean you know, or elsewhere. It's because there are so many that they've got to find a way to both exploit them and use them for social control. And that's that white race thing. England's unique position. So the peculiarity of the English plantation labor supply was not the cause, but an essential condition for the development of racial slavery. Um, and again, this peculiarity was it was supplied from free proletarians and so, uh, semi-proletarians and excluded persons of African descent, social control. He emphasizes the African migration, 10 to 11 million people, more people from Africa than Europeans come to the Americas up through 1800. People should know that. People don't know it. Vast implications, which we will continue to see the impact of, I believe, in the 21st century talks about the constant resistance, the, uh, repeated resistance, particularly pays attention to the significance of the Haitian struggle, how it also ties in with the Latin American struggle. Virginia Company Charter, he emphasizes when they set up, they're going to, they're going to come to Virginia, how they're going to have all the rights of free denizens and natural subjects of England. It's not going to be slavery, you know, when they first set it up. Was it capitalism? He goes through, you know, yes, it was capitalism, and he gets very specific about who the people were. From the outset, they avowed their faith. John Smith, we've all heard of him. All their aim was nothing but present profit, uh, a purely commercial effort. He goes through plantations as capitalist enterprises. Wh whatever the crop, 
Um, the, the means of production were monopolized by one class. Non-owners were reduced to absolute dependence. Products of the plantations took the form of commodities. Aim of production was the accumulation and expansion of capital. In the, uh, in the area of Virginia, the Native Americans, the Powhatans, had the preponderance of power in the early years. They actually helped keep the colonists alive through the starving period and things like that. The uh, colonists, the elite, the plantation elite, the rulers of the colony started moving to ways to bring less than free laborers to Virginia. And they started, this is still before Africans come, and they start bringing imprisoned convicts, vagrants, maids for wives, and uh, the duty boys, of course, are after the first Africans arrived. That's in 1920, and that's young, youngsters who were taken and brought there against their will uh, on the ship called the duty. First Africans come in 1619. There's no slavery in Virginia. Their status, whatever it was on the high seas, was not slavery in Virginia because there was no slavery. Um, that's that first arrival. Key event, 22nd March, 1622. The Native Americans, the Powhatans, in the area of Jamestown rise up and kill one-third of the colonists in one day, and within the next year, another one-third die. People can't even eat, they can't go out more than a few yards to even grow corn, right? Because corn would be a, a cover, you know, for attack, you know, people can... Okay. So, um, the laboring people are totally dependent on the ruling elite who control the access to the food supply. And what happens is uh, the ruling elite embarks on a scheme whereby tenants, tenants were people who worked the land, basically tenants at half was a, a, one of the labor relations at that time. You work the land, you keep half of what you produce, you turn over half of what you produce. The others were wa wage laborers, right? Uh, this, tenants and workers were reduced to unpaid long-term bond laborers. They, uh, and it's because they were dependent. It was like a, a 17th century shock doctrine is the example I've used, you know, where the ruling elite seizes on these, the vulnerability of the laboring people to impose these new, very horrible conditions of labor. And after, by the spring of 1622, you see appearing in the record talk, con, uh, words like heirs and assigns, human pe people could be assigned to the heirs of other human beings, their property, their chattel, right? This is new. They didn't have this before, right? That's not the rights of an Englishman, right? Chattel bond servitude was a qualitative break from English labor law, particularly the 1563 Statute of Artifices. It's not a feudal carryover. This feudalism is not what's in play here. It's capitalism, right? It's imposed as the custom of the country just like they don't like to mention slavery in the Constitution, you know, or the, as we've talked about, they, they refer to, slave owners refer to, quote, slavery as our peculiar institution. They're calling it the custom of the country. This is what, you know, they, they, got the, they do it today, right? They got their phrases. So they know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. And it's not apprenticeship. People are being bought and sold, right? And it's primarily Europeans at first because that's who's there. And England doesn't have control of the trade from Africa and laborers, right? The Netherlands is big, Portugal, Spain, right? But, but not England. England doesn't even really establish its Royal African Company until the 1670s. Um, and, it, and also the distance, whereas it may be there's certain routes that you can go if you're going to go to Barbados, say, for instance, or something like that, to come up to the uh, further north. It's more direct and less costly to bring laborers from England or Ireland um, in that period, right? So here's what the numbers are. And we, we don't want to lose sight of this. 92,000 European immigrants, 1607, 1682, three quarters were chattel laborers, bought and sold. People don't know this history, right? Yeah. 1676. The governor of, uh, of Virginia estimates 1,500 European chattel bond laborers arriving yearly, the majority English with a few Scots and fewer Irish. 
Allen emphasizes such, quote, recruitment was generally coercive. Few were wholehearted. You know, they're poor, they're in, you know, they're in, they're poor, they're in, in prison, whatever. They're, they're being forced to come, and few came with written contracts. We, we hear in all our history books about indent, white indentured servants and black slaves. Well, they weren't white, they weren't indentured, and the blacks weren't enslaved yet. So we've got to take another look. You know, in Virginia, right? We're talking about Virginia, what's going on, right? Such recruitment was, many were kidnapped, some were ordinary convicts, and still others were prisoners taken in rebellion and exiled. In this period of chattel bond labor, denial of family life, and Alan does some interesting things on this, and again, we might get into this later. This but, is volume two, right? Yeah, this is volume two. Marriage was incompatible with chattel status. You're gonna be a chattel bond server for five or six years, can't be getting married, you can't be having kids, that's time off from work, right? So, and, but, but for the laborers, this becomes another factor in their willingness to rebel. They can't even have normal relations. It, it's a crime to fornicate, right? It's a crime. You get whipped and beat. You know, maybe you got to do extra time. If you have a child, forget it. It is extra time, right? The employing class outlawed sexual and family life among limited term uh, bond laborers. Fine, whipping, or two to three months imprisonment. Women were exposed to special oppression. We, Alan goes through this twice the time for the woman if she does this. It's, uh, ministers were prohibited performing marriage ceremonies with a bond labor. The children of uh, those relationships were illegitimate. African Americans and European Americans, again, there's not so many African Americans in this early period yet, but Alan makes the point, as does Lerone Bennett Jr. We talked about this. The shaping of black America, recommended to get, recommended to make sure the libraries have it. Very good, right? Chattel bond servants were very similar up through 1676. The conditions were very similar. Bennett says it's no Garden of Eden, right? We understand that. These are tough conditions. But the similarity was there, right? Life expectancy was low. Um, status of African Americans, Allen argues, it was indeterminate. It was still being struggled out. It wasn't set, you know, in, in, and codified and all of this. So in the 17th century, in Virginia, African Americans, if they own property, right, could exercise marriage rights, exhibit social mobility, had some significant land holdings, some were owners of European American bond laborers, manifested many forms of resistance, uh, here's where he says it's indeterminate, it was being fought out, the status. Elizabeth Key is a prime example, that case we've mentioned, but please remember this one. 1856, she goes to court, she's a child of European, African American, um, and she argues when they try and extend her servitude, she argues, nope, I should be free. She makes two arguments, that she'd been baptized. And that English common law says the status of the child follows the status <coughs> of the father. Her father was European American. She prevails. First off, she goes to court and she's <coughs> able to give, <laughs> give statement, test and plead her case, right? This isn't going to happen later on, right? So she does this by 1662. <coughs> they realize this is not the direction they want, the plantation elite that they want to move. And they change that, but the Elizabeth's key, 16, 15, 1656 and 1662 in that period. But again, in the book, you'll find um, Alan does this in, in, in nice detail in, in volume two. But also, if you go online, if you go to his summary of the argument, I think he discusses the Elizabeth Key case there also. Um, and so she prevails, right? She makes those two arguments. Um, the white race did not exist in this period pre-Bacon's rebellion, uh, rebellion. Um, and um, although the plantation bourgeoisie was pressing to extend lifetime servitude, right, you know, they're, they're willing to move in that direction and, uh, uh, and proscriptions of free African Americans. So they're, they're moving in that direction, the ruling elite, right? Uh, but Allen emphasizes the invention of the white race at the beginning of the 18th century cannot be ascribed to demands by the European American laborers. They weren't the ones pushing this at all, right? Uh, the Dutch and the African bond laborers, it's only uh, at, after the end of the Second Dutch War in 1667 that there's the move to establish the Royal African Company within 40 years. 
uh, the Royal African Company would make English merchants preeminent suppliers of African bond labor, but that's later, so this is in this later period. Number of bond laborers was increasing, but what's key still in the period from 1674 to 1700, you have 6,000 African bond laborers come, but in, in a slightly uh, smaller period, 1680 to 1700, 30,000 European Americans, 24,000 bond laborers. So that's still what they're relying on for their plantation labor force be before they make the turn. Bacon's Rebellion, we've been through that. Great social unrest, a, ne a means of social control is needed. It's solved by the invention of the white race. Uh, codification, they go through all the laws which get codified. We've discussed this, here are some of the laws. What's very important to understand is Things that were rights in England are taken away from people in Virginia when they're chattel bond laborers. They're no longer rights, the right to marry, the right to do this and that, right? But then when they get reinstituted, they're not general rights, they are privileges. They're just for the whites, quote, whites, as they're developing this white race. Now, another important thing about the invention of this white race, and I hope I have the slide. Um, I don't know if I have it here. But they had to indoctrinate people in this, in their methods back then. That means they read it, they read it uh, um, at, at the churches, and they read it in the courthouse, and they post it on the walls. This is how they're spreading it, right? This is the mass media of the day, if you will. They had to teach these people they were white, right? The codification of white supremacy, free laws against African Americans, part of the special disparate treatment, the attacks on free African Americans is again, for it's aimed not only to attack the free African Americans, but for the European Americans to teach them this white thing, right? That you're not a Negro, right? Uh, propagandizing people, yeah. Laws mandated, parish clerks publish these laws in full to the congregants. Sheriffs post them at the courthouse door. The 1723 law to fix a perpetual brand, no free Negro, mulatto, or Indian shall have any vote. This repeals a law that had existed for uh, over 80 years in Virginia. Allen argues clearly the turn to racial oppression was no unthinking decision. This is the ruling elite making these decisions. They're conscious decisions. They know what they're doing. He goes into the denial of the right of self-defense and its particular male supremacist and white supremacist shaping. He discusses why the exclusion of free African Americans from so many of these rights. And it's, as he points out, it's the corollary of the establishment of white identity. It's the flip side, the extra punishment for African peoples, African Americans, and the white identity. Uh, he, he goes through the numbers, Jackson Turner, Maine, Aubrey Land, historians, to show that these European American laborers are not being promoted out of their class. You've got this history of so-called poor whites down south, right? Sixty percent of the white men were not owners of bond laborers. The white race social control formation, which gets established in Virginia, the pattern-setting colony, seven of the first 12 presidents, the founding fathers, this is where they establish it. They dominate the federal government up through the Civil War, right? The, 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 and, and to this day, they still have tremendous <laughs> influence, right? Um, but th in time, what this white race social control system begun in Virginia would serve as a model for all the succeeding plantation regions of settlement. Um, now, I want to go into a couple of other things. That we've gone through, some of this stuff we've gone through. I want to talk about Georgia for a second, five slides. Because Georgia, for a while, explored the uh, mulatto social control formation, which we see down in the Caribbean, right? And some people try and write and argue that George is an exception to the rule. But Allen puts it in a little uh, deeper context. Let's see how this goes, right? Georgia colony is founded in 1732 on the no slavery principle. Sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> was at first fine for South Carolina plantation. Now, if you know your geography, come down, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, right? South Carolina's got those big plantations. And the, the South Carolina plantation elite love, they're, they're cool with this all white Georgia, because that's a social control. That'll keep people from escaping, right? To, the, to Florida and the Spanish, Native Americans, right? So this helps with social control. 
a buffer against running away to Indians or Spanish Florida. So it's not high and mighty, you know, value so much for, for these South Carolina plant, uh, plantation owners. This is just helps us with our social control. Soon, however, as the South Carolina plantation bourgeoisie keeps developing their plantation, they want to move further, you know, they want to take it further. So they go down. They, Alan uses the phrase, and again, he's an economist too, so he likes to throw in the current phrase. So he says, in the terms of today, they wanted to grow the economy, right? <laughs> and so he goes, they, they, the plantation bourgeoisie, greedy for production based on lifetime hereditary bond servant, led efforts that resulted in Georgia's 1750 repeal of the ban on slavery. So they banned slavery in 1732, but in 1750 they repealed the ban, right? So you who, who, was, who was working the plantations prior to that? Uh, there, there were, there, first off, there weren't so many big plantations, right? It was more, it was more European American small things. It wasn't big plantations yeah, in Georgia, it, right? They do a lot of, was, was it rice? Yeah, but that comes later. Right. I mean, there, there weren't such big plantations in Georgia. It wasn't like, you know, uh, that much. I mean, it was more free. There might have been smaller plantations, but the big plantations are the ones that are coming with the backing from South Carolina, right? So um, that's 1750. And they, so, so South Carolina brings Georgia into the system that they have, Virginia has and everything. But in the course of the controversy, a Savannah man objected that the abandonment of slavery would take away work from white man's hands and impoverish them where the tradesmen are. And he says, look, in Charleston, we're all beggars now. You know, you're doing this and because they're bringing in black labor, unpaid, and they're doing this work. So the promoters of the slavery cause counted by saying that Negroes should not be allowed to work at anything but producing rice and felling timber, right? So this should be the work that they work in, right? And this means so other areas are going to be left for the exclusively for the, quote, whites, right? That was the trade-off. Yeah, yeah, at, at that time. But watch what happens. Uh, so in response, the 1750 uh, Act repealing the ban on slavery barred the employment of Negroes except in rice cultivation and coopering, thus establishing queer, uh, clear white labor privileges. To assure social control, the repeal of the no slavery principle in Georgia in 17 included privilege opportunity for propertyless European Americans by requiring the employment of one white man servant. We have these laws still today in some industries, right, called feather bedding. You know, we're guaranteed that somebody's going to have a job, right? But in 1765, Georgia Commons House, because the numbers, as they bring these big plantations in, they don't have the means of social control again. So in 1765, Georgia extends rights to free mulattoes due to the rise in bond laborers. So many bond laborers, African bond laborers are being brought in for the bigger plantations. So now they, they try mulattoes. This is what in the Caribbean, right? They've got to give special status to mulattoes. But by 1770, the practice quickly ends under a new slave code. Free mulattoes pose a threat to social control as examples of potential runaways as a challenge to white privileges. What Allen argues, this so-called Georgia exception, is actually totally consistent with the needs, the ruling class needs for social control. So they'll change it in different periods and different times. All right, that's white identity. A little more on white identity. Main barrier. Allen, I want to go back to this for a second. Allen argues there is nothing positive in the white race ruling class social control formation or in identifying as white. In his personal and political life, he tried not to think or act white. He, think, he thinks that's, you know, that's a way of thinking and acting, right? He explained the white race is now and, up, and always has been nothing other than a bourgeois social control formation. And he considered it the special obligation of the European American worker to act by resigning from the white race, joining the human race as, if you will, a born-again proletarian free of the incubus of white identity. Just break from it in every way you can, right? In, in practice, right? In your actions. He added that resigning does not entail entering some other racial or nationality, nationality carry, category such a European American remains a European American or something like that. But he's challenging. He's, he's saying there's nothing positive in white identity. There's nothing positive in this white race. 
We want to go after it every way we can, right? And I'll just say a little more on this. In 1911, 1912, Hubert Harrison, in the Socialist Party, led in a campaign in the Socialist Party uh, to start spelling Negro with a capital N. It was a break from all the racial epithets, from colored phrases like that, and it was to pose a challenge to white supremacy, right, the capital N. And within a short period of time, he's successful in the socialist press. The New York Times doesn't switch to the capital N until 1930 or 31. In the 1960s, era I'm growing up, as the struggle heightens, there's a move to, you know, call, you know, for in the African American community, various terms, you know, Afro American, black, or whatever, you know, and, and there's a move, but all of it, in, I mean, in general, broadly speaking, it's to pose a challenge to white supremacy, right? And so I think there's important lessons to learn from those two previous examples, but I think what Alan's getting at is very deep, and I think people... Because even like the word cool or the signification is not good, excuse me. Um, French, what is it? If you from New Orleans, you're French. Creole? Creole. 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 The French identify it with a capital C when the, the other part, I guess, what we call America, does it with a small C. Uh -huh. And everybody think it's a, a French heritage, but what cool joke means, all, all cool joke means is bring a slave. Uh -huh. And you look at the definition, uh -huh. and like, of course, when I was doing some research, I was like, wow. So Kujo means born a slave, but the French identified it that it was it was some type of heritage or culture. Mm -hmm. So they capitalized it. Mm -hmm. And we as Americans or American <laughs> consciousness did it as lower case. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. That, very interesting. I'm not so familiar with all that history, but I think I mean it's important, you know, how people define, how they self define and how they go after this stuff. Um, so again, this is from the introduction. This is a little more background for Alan in the beginning of his book, right? Uh, but Alan's not the only one. This is an interesting quote from James Baldwin. Alan writes, uh, they taught me to say I am not white. Here's a little James Baldwin for you. And so far as you think you're white, you're irrelevant. <laughs> it's kind of, huh? uh, he, he, he thinks if you're thinking and identifying as white, you, you're not really helping address the problems and stuff like that. I think that's what that's saying, right? Uh, Allen on black labor and white worker. Um, I mentioned this before. Uh, he talks about the um, enslaved black labor, understanding enslaved black laborers as proletarians. The examples we learn from, we tear the covers off white labor's betrayal, helps to see the invention of the white race. Allen says more. He says it's absolutely necessary to teach European American workers that historically the African American worker, bond and free, has been the quintessential, and that's Harrison's phrase, the American prole proletariat, right? As contrasted with the racially privileged, privileged divided self, white worker. But the operative significance uh, to whom it, depart, it, it is taught depends on focusing on the concept of white workers, quote, whiteness which keeps him a proletarian uh, man king, not by nature, but by self-defeating yet reversible choice. The reason that Afro-American workers are more consistent in the class struggle than European-American workers is because they are not white, right? This is what he says. There is nothing but a shortage of class consciousness and courage which prevent European-American workers from disaffiliating from the white race becoming there. So he's raising these issues. Why no socialism? Here's another little food for thought section. We got a little time. Allen, as I've mentioned, argues, he's a, he starts out in the 60s addressing why no socialism. And he goes through all the leading histories and their rationales for why the relatively low level of class consciousness in the US. And uh, here, here they are. They're in that article developing conjuncture. And he counters and he says, each of these issues, when you look at them closely, are white skin privileges and the real reason is uh, that white supremacy reinforced amongst uh, European Americans by white skin privilege has been the main retardant of class consciousness. Because he's getting at why in this country we don't even have a significant labor party. We don't have a significant left party of any sort. I mean, we're all, we, we see what's out there now, you know. We, we're all 
affected by it deeply, right? And he's trying to address that. And he goes through all these important writers, and he tries to emphasize um, that the, the centrality of white supremacy. And he, he, he doesn't bite his tongue, and he challenges major uh, figures in left and labor history. In his writings in the 60s, he writes on artful dodges. He talks about <coughs> six artful dodges. I just want to highlight a couple of them because we hear these arguments today, and I just want to call your attention to them. One is level up, level down. We realize there's disparate treatment between Europeans and African Americans, right? So one of the arguments says the way to handle the problem, don't take anything away from the whites, but give something to the blacks. Now, I meant to include, but I, as I mentioned when I'm speaking with Richard B. Moore's daughter this week, right? Richard B. Moore, leading black activist, African Blood Brotherhood, Socialist Party, Communist Party, the famed Scottsboro orator, and ran the Frederick Douglass bookstore for many years in Harlem, right? A giant of black history, I think. And um, in the 1940s, the Communist Party was involved in a uh, struggle for jobs on 125th Street in Harlem. A lot of the st stores were owned, you know, not by African Americans, and uh, they wanted to demand you know, jobs where, where they shopped, right? You know, in the street in the neighborhood. So they're waging that struggle. They're waging that struggle, very good struggle, right? But in the course of that struggle, the issue came out, well, what happens if this is gonna cost jobs for white workers? And Richard Moore says, listen, it's inevitably gonna do that. That's what it's gonna mean. You know, if you're gonna fight this struggle, some white workers are gonna lose their jobs. You, you, you know, and you can play games if you want. And he was, and he said the position should be that we support our thoroughgoing demand for black jobs in these places, right? He was brought up on trial in the Communist Party. And he was found guilty of what was, in the, in the phrases of those days, a narrow nationalist deviation. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he winds up leaving the party. Um, but s some years later, a fellow named Abner Berry, who chaired the trial board, says, well, as I look back, Moore was right, you know? And, um, but I think that's an important issue because we can't avoid it. What Alan says, if you're gonna take this position, that's one sure way of maintaining the white privileges if you're not gonna challenge this. And this is not an easy thing to grapple with, right? But that's why I say if we understand from the civil rights struggles or if you're a labor person and you wage in a struggle, whether it's in your pay location where we're gonna stand up to the boss and we're not gonna let him keep abusing us, you run a risk, right? If you're gonna go out on strike, you run a risk. But if the goal is higher, if you're trying to push this forward and build this struggle, you know, you've gotta do, and these are communists we're talking about, you know, and, and so, um, I think it's very important, but Alan says if you make that argument, level up, don't level down, that's one sure way of perpetuating the white skin privilege. He uses the example of fair employment through full employment. I've grown up since the 60s, I followed these things, I don't know what they consider full employment now, 6% unemployed, used to be 4%, whatever they call it, whatever they call it, it's two to one. Right? It's been black to white, two to one. So if they're just saying fair employment through full employment, they're not challenging that two to one differential. Since nothing is to be taken away from the white worker, including his privilege of being first, what's the privilege? First hired, last fired, right? If you're not gonna challenge that, you're not gonna deal with this. So that's one, that's, that's one. Level up, don't level down. But that, that article dodging number one, I believe today would be dismissed as nothing more than somebody will crit critique and or criticize that as some kind of uh, special handout or some kind of welfare for individuals who may not necessarily be as deserving, you know, um, or to give, uh, to, to level up, um, to try and have an equal and or balanced kind of hiring would just be dismissed. Well, as, just in brief response, um, we need jobs. Oh, I agree. We need jobs, and we want affirmative action in those jobs. We could take one-tenth of our defense spending this year and provide jobs, you know, it, so it can be done. People might make the arguments you're making, but it can be done. So we, we have to point out, and do we need jobs? We need jobs in education. We need car jobs fixing the roads. We need jobs in so many places, right? It's not... 
This is what we need, and this is what we should, I think we should be pushing for. But when we're pushing for, we're, you know, we're going, we're pushing, and we're challenging, we're pushing the affirmative action. This is what we want to go. We want, we, want, we want to do away with that two-to-one. There's no reason we have to have that two-to-one ratio. So this is level up, don't level down. Number, another artful dodge, and this I see in some of the current groups, and you'll see this in very prominent people who talk about race in this country. They talk about, well, the short-term interest and the long-term interest. Even prominent lefties, I have friends, you know, you know, who say, well, yeah, maybe now the interests aren't the same, but in the long term they are the same, right? Or, or those who maintain that white workers benefit from privilege, well, they might try and say, well, in the short term they benefit, but not, you know, and not in the long term. And they try. Allen's arguing, and so they argue what we need is parallel struggles. And he's, Alan argues that the immediate interests of the white worker are in, uh, oh, that, that, that's not Alan's argument, that's the dodge. The immediate interests are in conflict, but in the long term, their interests are the same, right? Same. Alan, and therefore, we need parallel struggles. Well, you struggle there, we'll struggle here, and you know, we'll come together down the road, right? Uh, eventually, our efforts will join. Um, and Alan says, as far as the fatal poison of white skin privileges, these dodges do not have in mind parallel struggles, but opposite ones. We shall never get to that day uh, except by steps, and we can never come if we're going in opposite directions. The day-to-day -day real interest of the white workers is not the white skin privileges, but the development of that ever-expanding class consciousness and class unity, the only sure measure. That is why racism must be made the central issue day by day. So he's arguing against this. It's not in short-term or long-term interest of white workers, <coughs> right? Another argument you'll see out there, and this one was big. Um, and this one, when Allen puts out his stuff in the 1960s, in these pamphlets, White Blind Spot and stuff like this, it gets picked up. I think I've mentioned to you the SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society. It's a front page article, the national campaign for um, uh, to fight white skin privilege. It influences the new left for a period. But there's a sector of that student movement, some people you still read about in the media today, you know, the old, uh, who went into groups, weathermen and stuff like that, and they basically took the position uh, that the white workers were bought off, don't waste time on them, support national liberation, right? And so what Alan argues is that, and, but th this, group, this is still out there in various forms today by a number of groups. So, um, and they would argue the privileges these workers are paid for by super profits, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole analysis. Uh, and, and they argue that victorious national liberation struggles will chop off these sources of white skin privileges, and uh, then the white workers will see the light and they'll come and struggle, right? So Alan says it's wrong because the white skin privileges of the mass of the white workers do not permit them to escape into the ranks of the property classes. They're still working people, right? The workers, right? In the South, where the white skin privileges has been most emphasized and most pronounced, the white workers have fared far worse than the rest of the country, right? Mm -hmm. The white skin privilege for the mass, he equates it to the trustees' privilege in the, in the prison. It's not released from jail, merely freedom of movement with a diet, diet a little more adequate, right? It, but this ain't, you know, like you're being promoted out of the class and got it all that good. Uh, and he emphasized it's not that the ordinary white worker gets more than they must have to support themselves and his family, but the black worker gets less than the white worker. And the result is that by reinforcing and perpetuating racing, racist attitudes, the present-day power masters get the political support of the rank-and-file white workers. Um, he also says it's dishonest because it promises to support the black struggle but refuses to uh, give the most meaningful support to challenge the ideology and practice of white supremacy among the white workers. Go back to what Harrison said about they got to wage that struggle against the white workers, right? And cowardly because it chooses the role of supply troops rather than frontline uh, fighters. Yeah, we support, we support, we support, right? You know, instead of really getting actively in the fight. All right. Allen, when he talks about working class interest, he will go back to Marx and he'll talk about in the national struggles of the proletarian uh, point out and bring to the fore the common interest of the entire proletariat and in the various stages within the struggles of the working class against the bourgeoisie always and everywhere represent the interest of the uh, workers as a whole. He tries to keep those principles in mind, push the interest of working people all, you know, not chop us up into different groups.
Again, Alan emphasizes the initiator and ultimate guarantor is not the white worker, but with the white worker's master. Uh, history has shown that the white skin privilege does not serve the interests of the white workers, and he goes through this. And if you read that article on developing conjuncture, I try to pull out a lot of his writings on this and lead to point, you know, where he elaborates further. He says, uh, one of his slogans that I like very much is, solidarity forever. That's a big slogan of the labor movement, means privileges never, right? Um, another one, he, he talks about race privilege policy. It is deliberate bourgeois class policy. It is contrary to the appearance, contrary to the interest short and long term, not only of black workers, but white workers as well. And when he comes down and talks about it, he basically says, we're back to, this is the old slogan of the Wobblies, the IWW, the group that Harrison goes <coughs> with. An injury to one is an injury to all. If we mean that, we have to oppose these things, right? This is, Alan uses the analogy of a poison bait, that the white skin privileges are a poison bait for the workers, for the European American workers. It looks good, but it's not in your interest. Your interest is co solidarity with your coworker, your fellow worker. Um, Examples, invention, all right, Africans. I wanted to talk briefly about this. This is the early colonization. We haven't gotten into this too much, but it's in Allen's work. Um, the Spanish and the Portuguese first looked to the native populations when they were going to come to the Americas, right? And the Spanish did so, as he writes, with such spirit that in the course of a century, from 1503 to 16 and a half, century and a half, from 1503 to 1660, they tripled uh, Europe's silver resources and added uh, one-fifth Europe's supply of gold. In the process, these conquistadors almost completely destroyed the indigenous population they came in contact with, introducing <coughs> exotic diseases coupled with merciless imposition of forced labor. And he goes through this, and this is interesting to read, and he has nice citations. The native population of Hispaniola, right? Dominican Republic, Haiti, right? was reduced from 1 million in 1492 to 26,000 in 1540. This is staggering, right? And to virtual extinction by the end of the century. The same genocidal labor regime uh, simultaneously destroyed the native population of Cuba at a, ca a comparable rate. The European diseases, smallpox, measles, typhus, and the forced labor reduced the population of central Mexico from 13.9 to 1.1 million between 1492 and 1605. The impact of disease, the meter that was their for, forced labor um, set up, and the equivalent of the Mexican repartimiento was equally devastating in Peru, which was reduced from 9 million to 670,000 in 1620, right? Staggering numbers. In Brazil, the Portuguese and the Dutch, because the Dutch came in also, sought to recruit their labor force from the native population. Now, Brazil is on a continent, though, right? So whereas in the islands, people, you know, just wiped out and decimated, people can escape on the big continent. And that's also what they f was going to be faced here in the U.S., you know, what becomes the U.S. in North America. Uh, the in so in, in, in the continent down there, the indigenous population was largely successful in avoiding reduction to slavery, right, any form of slavery. So Allen then argues for two opposite reasons there's the turn to Africa by the Europeans, right? Because they're looking to make money, right? Gold, silver, whatever. So one, when they had accessibility, they destroyed the labor force. And two, when they didn't have inaccessibility, then they needed laborers, right? That's the Brazil case. So the Iberians turned to Africa as a labor source, right? This was a labor reserve which they had some familiarity with. Medieval Europe secured its slaves by trade with southern Russia, Turkey, the Levant, the eastern coast of the Adriatic. Uh, that's where the name Slav comes from, right? Uh, and as well as purchasing Negro supply by North African Arab merchants. Spain enslaved Muslim Moors in border regions. In the middle of the 15th century, the Portuguese uh, successfully ran a, an end around uh, the North African Arabs. By the end of the century, Portuguese enterprise uh, had supplied 25,000 Africans to Sao Tome. In the 16th century, African proportion of the slave population increased in those countries, right? 
And during the very early days of American colonization, a number of American Indians were shipped back and forth. By the first decade of the 17th century, English colonization was ready to go. So he, he just reviews some of that. But I, what I find very interesting is that for the, you know, why they turn to African labor, right? The first, first thing is they'll use what's there, right? They'll use the labor that's there until they wipe it out or they, they can't, and then they've got to look. Further north, they're turning to English and Irish labor because that's what they can bring over. Um, so the English were confronted with the common. When they settle Jamestown, they're confronted with the common twofold problem that all these European colonizing powers are going to confront. How do we secure our labor supply and how do we maintain social control? I mean, I think we want to think this way, you know, you think from their perspective. So in both ways, what they wind up doing is unique from all these other places because their primary labor supply at first is from Europe and then they maintain social control by promotion of a sector of, this lab of that labor supply to this white race thing. So it's unique on both counts, right? Slavery is capitalism. We've been through this. Maybe we're going to wrap up. Alan goes through a very detailed analysis, which is in the article, making clear. Because some people say, oh, slavery is not capitalism, you know, blah, blah, blah. Alan goes through and makes arguments. Uh, we must do more than expose the inconsistence. So where capitalist conceptions predominate, and he quotes, he'll quote from Marx and Engels, then he'll show you CLR James and various people, but then he'll look at the actual facts of what went on. Let me see what else. Um, Uh, one last thing, if I can find it. This one, I just want to talk about this. This is this, the Communist Party and the National Question Theory. People may be familiar with this. Communist Party of the U.S. left group in the 1930s opened with a ringing call to struggle against white supremacy. Basically, the Communist Party adopted a national question analysis at a certain point, late 1928 to 30. Yeah. And they argued that black people in the uh, South constituted a Negro nation, right? And a lot of this analysis came from Soviet nationality theory because, you know, they were influenced very much by the Soviet Union. Some of their leading theoreticians went to the Soviet Union. And um, if you read carefully some of that analysis, they, to try and explain it, they will describe the South as semi-feudal or peasantry, not as capitalist, right? So it poses some problems in terms of what actually happened there. But Alan, Alan wants to focus on something else. And it's, this is in some ways a good thing to, to bring to your attention for a struggle today. Um, in the 1930 resolution, besides calling, I mean, there were some very good things the Communist Party did. They, they treated the, quote, Negro question as a revolutionary question. Same thing Harrison tried to raise 20 years earlier, right? They put out a call for a Negro nation and the right to self-determination. They also, in those resolutions, um, had another section of provisions which made it the struggle for equal, must certainly take the form of common struggle by white and black workers. And they argued it is the duty of the white workers to make a breach in the walls of segregation and Jim <coughs> Crowism. The white workers, and this is the phrase that really stands out, must boldly jump at the throat of the 100% bandits who strike a Negro in the face. So they were making it a principal duty of the white comrades, if you will, to oppose white supremacy. And this was very much a break from the left, the organized left in the US. And the Communist Party did some very good things in the 30s and 40s. There's stuff written on this, right? And earned some respect, well-deserved respect. Um, to Allen, this was an American working class party taking up as its aim the principle that Harrison had articulated in 1912 and that Du Bois had set forth in 1913 in these oft-quoted words, the Negro problem is the great test of the American socialist. So there's some good right, coming out of that. But here's what some other things. Because Allen wants to make a subtle point, and I want to get to that, right? In the early 30s, the Communist Party held to this resolve. but. Then in the 30s, as the 30s progressed, in the name of anti-fascist unity, you know, they got involved in their struggles, it converted itself into the auxiliary of the New Deal and strengthened the tendency, which did the same for the, uh, for the industrial union movement. It, we're, we're, we're almost, we're right to the last thing, three minutes. Okay. 
So they are they're going to get behind FDR's New Deal. Now, previously when we talked about the three crises, we talked about how FDR's New Deal was so shaped by the Dixiecrat influence in it and all those programs and policies. So the Communist Party and the working didn't have to hold the Southern vote. That was Roosevelt. Roosevelt wanted to hold them, but the Communist Party, he said, could have pushed forward with their very principal stand. But they didn't, right? And he notes that beginning in 1936, there is little said about white chauvinism. That's the phrase they used right back then. Chauvinism has to do with national loyalty. They're treating it as a national question. In the official statements of the party and the South, instead of being glad that black workers were more easily organized than whites, the AFL and CIO backed away from organizing black workers, right? They didn't want to go too far on this. So regarding the national question, Allen offered the following. And this is just some food for thought. This is when he's saying, well, people say, well, do you think there's a black nation in the South or not? Right? It's a question, fair question. He goes, if Afro-Americans ask my, ask my opinion in the matter of the national question, and I do not expect to be asked, you know, he's saying basically that's a decision for African-Americans to make. He goes, I will express my opinion if I have one, which I think worth expressing, but not otherwise. That attitude, attitude seems consistent with the principle of self-determination for oppressed peoples. Furthermore, I, help, I believe it helps me, this is Alan talk, to keep the focus of my attention where it should be more appropriately placed on the struggle amongst European Americans uh, to analyze and expose the race privilege system in this country. On the other hand, however, he says, if I am asked to participate in a discussion around the question, do the white people in the United States constitute a nation, I will do so and begin at least by arguing the negative. Right? No white nation. Right? I think that's important because here some people put that. Um, he goes into, there was uh, one last thing. Um, okay, this is the last point. This subtle point is the last slide. All right? All right. On the black belt nation theory, what Alan says is the following, and this is just, you know, throw it out there to begin, because we, we, we can probe this much more deeply down the road. By its very existence, this theory represents a rejection, uh, uh, well, as he put it, he's trying to reach a more subtle matter, excuse me, both in the acceptance phase and the rejection phase. Let me explain. The Communist Party in the 1950s abandons the Black Belt Nation thesis, right? And this is the period when Alan winds up leaving the Communist Party. But he goes both when they accepted the thesis and they rejected the thesis, the fact of holding or having held the black belt nation theory served to give a gloss, a sophistication to the essential process of the party's abandonment of the struggle against white supremacy, right? They could hold it to nation or not hold it, but if they're backing off the struggle, you know, that's what the, the key thing is to wage that struggle and sometimes the elaborate theory can give a gloss to you know the fact that you're not fighting the struggle so he, he argues that although the nation theory of the presto afro-americans Afro have been shown to be incompatis, incompatible with the fullest class collaboration it is equally well demonstrated that holding the theory by white radicals does not constitute the slightest obstacle to the betrayal of their specific obligations in the struggle against white supremacy to fight white opportunism among white workers in particular. So we'll end that with that today, but that's last food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.